Welcome to the Movement Upgraded Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jen Hostler, licensed physical therapist and certified strength and mobility coach. Here you can expect to hear about all things movement. The Movement Upgraded Podcast is a blend of the science of strength training, rehab, and mobility mixed with the personal and professional experience to provide you with the steps you need to keep your body pain-free and moving well so you can do what you love forever. Welcome back to the Movement Upgraded Podcast. I'm Dr. Jen, and we are going to chat about three misconceptions about the rehab process. So we had filmed a or recorded a prior episode about the Movement Upgraded process and kind of how we approach rehab and who we work with, because I think it's really important when we talk about our rehab process to like help you understand that it's the way that we do things and a lot of the way that I do things is very much for a particular population and I may change things a little based off of a different population or um, like if I were to work with somebody who for example, has come off of a surgery. Um, That is a little bit of a different rehab process, right? So I think it's really important to understand that. So we recorded that and that is a very long episode about like our background and why Movement Upgraded exists. Um, So if you haven't checked that out and you wanna learn a little bit about that, I highly recommend it. This is kind of a follow up to that where we can really highlight um, the three main things to understand about the rehab process in general and what it looks like and what people think it's going to look like. And this is based off of the past, I've been a PT now for five years. So this is based off the past five years of me experiencing things and really talking to people and communicating with them and listening to them and realizing kind of what the misconceptions are and in their understanding of things. And this is also even my own experience. I kind of thought rehab looked differently um, than it actually did. And um, yeah, I think even when I graduated PT school, I thought it was gonna be different. I've talked about that a few times. So let's get into the three main misconceptions that people have. So the first thing that I feel is a misconception that's probably the most common is that people think that coming into physical therapy is just getting a list of exercises. And um, this is not all people. Some people think that they are going to get a massage or get a hot pack put on them. But I would say like the, the kind of the public understanding because I think of social media a lot is that you just need the list of exercises to fix X, right? To like, d- tackle your rehab thing. So like there's a list of exercises for low back pain or for sciatica. And I think this has been perpetuated since um, social media has become popular and those are the types of posts that are really popular. So they will get tons of likes and comments and saves and lots of engagement. And it seems really great. Like, wouldn't that be amazing if all it was is here, if you have neck pain, are the exercises to do? I wouldn't have a job. It's like silly to think that that's as simple as it is. Um, So it's not just a list of exercises. Yes, there are lists of exercises that we provide, but I actually refer to them as a program. And my clients, when they come to work with me, they get mobility programming and or strength programming. Usually it's a combination of both at some point, Um, but it is a program. And these exercises or the programming isn't about the exercises. It's actually about the adaptations we are trying to facilitate in the body. So I um, can give, let's say like, let's talk about exercise and what it really does actually. So when we are choosing exercises for people, we want to choose an exercise that's going to either, um, that's going to do something that we want to do. We want the body to make changes to accomplish something that is necessary for your rehab process. So if you come in to my office with some low back pain and I look at your back and I assess your hip and your back doesn't move very well, you don't have great control of it, um, we look at breath work and then I also look at your hip and your hip internal rotation is really limited. That's telling me your entire hip mobility is going to be limited um, and your hip capsule, like the deep part of your joint, is probably pretty 
stiff and we need to target that because that means that your spine is going to end up taking up a lot of the slack if you can't move at your hip and we try to do these movements we need to do like squatting down to a toilet your spine's going to have to compensate a ton so when we are doing something we look at the limitations that we can think are contributing to the problem and then we come up with ways to address those limitations so limited hip mobility um, for me would mean I would have to look at, okay, do you lack the strength or do you lack the flexibility? And, uh, let's say for example, you lack the flexibility. So I try to move your hip and it's really stiff and stuck. Like I can't move it. That means that you need better flexibility, which means we are definitely going to start with some stretching because I need that those tissues to be more flexible. I need your, your hip to rotate a little bit more and that's what stretching does. So that is an example of how we have to think about exercises. And that's what the rehab process is, is finding what limitations you have and then figuring out what adaptations we want and then finding the exercises that work best for you. So I just gave you an example of, okay, now I need to stretch in and give you a hip internal rotation stretch, but that doesn't tell me what position and what it's going to look like. If I had five different people who needed hip internal rotation stretches, there's a very good possibility that I could be giving five different variations of those stretches because everybody is different. Some people can get into these extreme positions and they might need to, to feel the stretch. Other people, it's like, oh my gosh, I've got to actually just teach you how to move your body because when I try to put you into a stretch, you're moving your spine everywhere and you don't know how to control that to get the stretch to only be at your hip. So this is why it's important to understand it's not a list of exercises because it's never a list of exercises for the people that I work with. And also it's a lot more than that. It's coaching. The rehab process is very much more like a fitness and going through and getting to know your coach and working with your coach to achieve a goal, setting goals, right? Assess where you are, find your starting point, and then slowly find the best entry point and then progressing from there until you reach your, and navigating things, right? There's gonna be like things that come up and things that you're gonna have to navigate and they're gonna communicate with you and we've gotta work on mindset barriers and there's a lot that goes into it. And so just like we would do that in fitness, that is exactly um, very similar to how we would do that in rehab. And I think that we look at physical therapy way more from a healthcare provider perspective of give me a pill or give me a solution, write it and I will show up, I'll get it done and I'm gonna wash my hands of it and I'm done. But physical therapy and rehab is very, is much more like fitness in that we are working way closer. We're getting a deeper relationship established with you. We're talking about habits and how to establish those and unpacking some of the mindset things and, and all of that. So it's way more complicated and it's not just a list of exercises. Um, the second most common misconception is going to be the idea that your provider is going to fix you. So this means like coming in and thinking, that you're gonna have the provider do these things to you or for you. They have all the answers and you come in, you do your therapy, they fix you or whatever, and I'm putting quotation marks there around the fixing, and then you leave, you go home, and that's it. Um, and then you go back and, and you do therapy again, right? So it's very much like therapy is at the office. Maybe you have some exercises at home, but really the important part is showing up, doing the exercises in the therapy office and then going home. And it's just not like this integrative thing in your life, but it should be um, for a lot of people. It's not it's not like that. Your therapist isn't going to fix you. In fact, the best thing your therapist can ever do is just educate you and then provide you with some ways to achieve your goals, whether that's like some ways to keep moving, some ways to modify your movement, some education um, in understanding those things. But like, that's really what rehab is. Um, your provider isn't going to put their hands on you and fix you. When I was younger, I thought that was like, what I needed or I thought that was the way it was and I, I searched so um, if you haven't listened to my very early podcast about my story I've had a lot of injuries but one of the biggest things for me in my rehab journey 
was being diagnosed with scoliosis when I was 14. And for a very long time, I thought I needed to fix my scoliosis, right? So I kept looking for providers who were gonna fix my scoliosis or help me fix it. When in reality, my ultimate goal was just, I wanted to be out of low back pain, but I thought I needed to fix my scoliosis. And so I kept looking for providers who could like do manual therapy and release something or like fix something. And it sounds enticing to us because it means the pressure's off of us. We don't have to work. Um, and so like, it sounds really nice. Like I still wish that somebody could do that. Now it's not the way that things work. No, like we're not uh, a therapist when they work on you. They're not actually like doing anything that's breaking up adhesions. They're not putting anything back in place. They can't release something. They can make something help facilitate something to relax. They can make something subjectively feel better. They can facilitate some adaptations by communicating um, through force to the cells to lay down healthier collagen and connective tissue. Um, and in general, massage and manual therapy and putting hands on people when it's consensual is definitely something that can be down regulating and calming, but they're not going to be able to fix you. It's going to be very much a two person team. You have to show up and put in effort and really be like, like there. Now you're going to have days where maybe you aren't a hundred percent there, right? Like that's not what I'm saying that like, it's all on you. Sometimes we have to meet you where you are, but, um, it's definitely not show up you can just check out during the hour and do whatever. It's very much like you need to be intentional and pay attention and, and be ready to make some changes if you want certain results. So your provider is not going to fix you. We are often going to have to work on those lifestyle and behavior changes like stress management, better sleep hygiene, daily movement, um, and maybe like adjusting your fitness programming or adding some of that in, things like that, because really pain comes down to healthy behaviors just as much as anything else does in our lives. So it's your therapist's job to kind of facilitate those and help you find ways that work for you and um, start where you are, but it's definitely not going to be up to them to fix you. Um, and you're not broken. <laughs> That's what's really important to understand. Maybe you don't feel like you want to feel, maybe you feel like your body kind of betrays you a little bit or you're frustrated with it, which is totally understandable, but you're not broken. You just uh, need maybe a little bit of support and guidance and assistance in helping you achieve the goals that you need. So the third thing is going to be that you'll get a clear diagnosis of what's wrong with you. I think this is something that a lot of people uh, think because of the way our healthcare system in the United States definitely is. And I'm sure, I, I'm sure this is true for other countries to an extent, but in the United States is about all I can speak on. Um, but what I do know is our old like model and the way that we approached healthcare was very biomedical. I've talked about this a little bit in the past, but biomedical approach just means we're really focused on um, the biology. So we're really focused on your muscle, your disc in your back and things that are we can see on an image or um, diagnose, diagnosis diagnoses um, that give you a name for what's going on in your body and that completely ignored what we know now which is that how we experience life in our bodies whether that experience is being healthy or whether that means we have some pain is very much a inter uh, is a product of the interrelationship of the biopsychosocial components of being a human. So yes, there is biology for sure. Um, that does influence things, but also psychology, like our mental state, our mental health affects how we feel. Um, and this is very, very important. Actually, people with more mental health struggles are going to experience more pain. We know that because pain has a lot more to do with our body's perception of threat and it's an experience more than it really means that we have an injury somewhere. Um, and then social is also all of the other components like your social support, the quality of the relationships that you have and the environment that you're in. All of those things can affect your pain and injuries that you experience as a product of, of those things. 
things, those factors that interact. So old school would be like, we need to come up with a diagnosis and this is the way insurance still works. Um, and that diagnosis has certain amount of treatment that, um, is recommended for it. And that's how we do things. Um, diagnoses in rehab are really not super helpful for the most part. Now, I will say it is helpful to figure out maybe like what tissue is involved. So do we have an injured like muscle or are we thinking there is more of an injured tendon or are we thinking that you are dealing with a joint issue those things are all a little bit different and so it's really important to understand that um that dictates our treatment but we don't need to have this specific exact perfect diagnosis um common diagnoses um in rehab are going to be things like impingement syndrome for the shoulder that doesn't tell me anything except for you have symptoms in your shoulder that's all that tells me um impingement syndrome really doesn't mean anything and a lot of my patients who've come in with diagnosis diagnoses that they've been told of impingement syndrome are actually um dealing with pain that is starting in in um it's a problem in their neck and that neck problem is referring pain into their shoulder or the nerve in their shoulder is aggravated, but not as a byproduct of a shoulder issue um, or impingement, quote unquote, but also from neck. The other reason I don't love impingement is because as you bring your arm overhead, you imp- the tissues in your arm are getting impinged. That is normal. So now we are creating an, a, a fear around something that actually happens already normally in our bodies. And so diagnoses, according to the way that we typically do are not even helpful. What's really helpful when it comes to rehab and working on understanding what's going on in your body is understanding the general tissue that might be affected. And then also looking at, um, what you want to accomplish. So it's not just the pain that you're experiencing and what's causing it. It's also like, what is it keeping you from being able to do? Because that's how we're going to measure your progress. Um, because it's not very often we think that like the rehab process is one day I'm going to wake up and my pain's going to be gone. Like I'm going to start exercising, doing all these things, going to therapy. And then one day my pain's gone and I'll never feel it again. It's not like that very often. It's like, um, maybe my pain, my constant pain levels are down. Um, maybe I have less frequent flare-ups even though they're still happening maybe my flare-ups aren't changing in frequency but they're not as severe when they happen or they don't last as long um or maybe i'm simply just having a better mindset and it's not turning into this incapacitating thing where i can't do anything and i'm starting to learn that like it's not affecting my life as much those are all ways that that we measure progress um that's the rehab process (laughs) like It's not this diagnosis, this set of exercises and fixing you in the session. It's getting an idea of where are the problems, what can be some of the contributing factors, because there are... I know in, I know as humans, we want direct answers and things we can cling to. I totally get it. When you're in pain, there's some fear and emotions going on too. And we have this tendency to go to worst case scenario, especially if we have any sort of anxiety or any mental health issues. Again, goes back to biopsychosocial, right? Those all affect it. And so we want this, like, we want this tangible thing. We want to know, we want certainty and What we used to think, um, and the reason the biomedical model is so popular is because if we get a picture of what things look like and we see something on that picture in an MRI or an x-ray, we can be like, that's it. That's the cause. Um, And that makes things certain and that makes us feel like we're in control. But the problem with that is what we know now in research is when people get images and they see things that actually contributes to worse pain and worse functional outcomes down the road. So it actually is worse for us. Um, We also know that those images that we might see and the things we might see on those images may have been there long before the pain and they may have nothing to do with the pain. Um, People can have signs of degeneration, impingement. uh, You can't see impingement, by the way. Um, Rotator cuff tears. They have like... uh, cartilage tears in their knee or meniscus tears they have all kinds of things um labral tears in their hips and in their shoulders and they didn't know it these are people who've never had pain but they were imaged so if you can have those things and not have pain 
And you can also have pain and there can be nothing that shows up on an image, which is also what we found in research. Then we can't say that we should ever get an image because it doesn't really help us figure things out. Now, there are times when we should go and get an image if, um, you know, there are signs that maybe something more serious is going on or you're not responding to rehab and they're considering like um, doing some other alternative thing. But before that and, and otherwise, it's not helpful. And actually, there is research to show that it's more harmful for us now um, to actually get those images. Um, it seems at first like it would be helpful, though, right? Because it gives us something to cling to. Um, and same with a, a, an official diagnosis like impingement syndrome. By the way, in musculoskeletal stuff, so in rehab, if we have, if you have been given a diagnosis that says things like syndrome, um, it doesn't really mean anything. And the idea of syndrome means that we've ruled out every other thing. And so it's, we can't figure out exactly what it is. And it's got these groups of symptoms. And so we're going to throw it into this umbrella term of impingement syndrome. Same with piriformis syndrome, IT band syndrome. They're really not helpful information. So um, it's really important to know that. The other reason I don't like these terms also is that it kind of gives us something to like wear as like an identity. And um, we think, oh, I can't do this because I have impingement syndrome or I have degenerative disc problems or I've got spondylysis, spondylolysis. Um, or something along those lines. And sometimes that can become more of a problem and it, and it gives us more of a fixed mindset about our bodies rather than understanding that our bodies are very dynamic and capable and strong and resilient and can make changes. Um, and if our expectations are that this diagnosis is something we have and we're stuck with it and it's always gonna be there, then that is exactly what's going to happen. Um, but if we have more of an open mindset and a growth mindset about our bodies and we're like, look, I've been diagnosed with this, that but like I know that the human body is really capable and strong and I don't really I don't really care if I have that, if I can still get better, those are the people who are going to get better. So like one of the biggest things for me that changed my overall health when it in pain, when it came to my back and understanding scoliosis is realizing that I'm always gonna have scoliosis but that doesn't mean I'm always going to have pain and realizing that there is nothing that scoliosis really changes for me except for it makes me look different. It makes me completely have a disappeared torso um, and it makes me have a rib hump and it makes me asymmetrical. So it makes my movement look different. But if I can accept those things as non-problematic because there is no research to say that those things are problematic, even though a lot of schools of thought like to say that, then I can actually live a very fulfilling, amazing life without very much pain. And in fact, I do. And that was what the biggest pivotal change was for me. Um, not the, it might be the biggest. It was combined with um, exercise. But I think that if I didn't believe that or didn't understand that, um, I may not have done the exercises or been committed to them. And so it's really important, I think, to not wear our diagnoses as like this identity when it comes to musculoskeletal rehab. So if you have ever thought you were gonna go get a diagnosis when it comes to things or um, comes to a physical therapist, you're probably not gonna get this like very clear cut diagnosis. Instead, you're gonna get, here's what I think is going on. Like you have some sort of, I would say, for example, if you have low back issues, I'd be like, you're low back, you have no control of it, it's pretty weak, um, it, you haven't moved it a lot over many years, so likely it's not, all of the tissues are not super strong and healthy, I've also found this, this, and this, so maybe limited hip internal rotation, um, and a lack of like hip control, which means that we are probably using your spine a lot more than, um, it needs to and when you try to use your spine it doesn't have control or the tissue capacity so those are the things that we need to address to help you feel better and to help you be able to do the things that you want to do and that's really what we should be kind of paying attention to when it comes to rehab and not so much like looking for this clear-cut diagnosis as much as having this perfect diagnosis wrapped up in a pretty pink box with a bow would make things easier. Um, we know that like the way that life works is not always the easy route. It's looking at, um, okay, is your body basically physically prepared for the types of activities you want to do? Um, or was it prepared for the things that you wanted to do when you injured it? If not, how do we address that and get you 
get your tissues, get your body prepared for the things that you want to do and be able to do that in a way that's pain free or minimal pain levels. And that's really what the rehab process looks like. So hopefully that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea, but basically rehab's just like a process of a team working together, you with your clinician to help you achieve your goals. And, and that's what coaching is. It, it's coaching. Um, it's just navigating the struggles of life together, adjusting your programming, which is your quote unquote list of exercises, but programming is a little bit more uh, sophisticated and in line with what we should be doing. Um, progressing you when your body is ready, coaching you to feel the things you need to or improve your awareness and execution of the movement so you can make sure that you're um, really understanding and moving in a way that is going to achieve the things that you want to do with said movement. Um, and then to help you connect the dots of what life things are contributing to the symptoms that you're experiencing. And that's the point of rehab. So um, hopefully that you can leave this podcast kind of understanding these three misconceptions a little bit better that it's not just a list of exercises. Your provider's not going to fix you because you're not broken. Um, and that you're not necessarily gonna get a clear diagnosis, quote unquote, of what's wrong with you, but you are hopefully going to leave empowered and feeling like you have some hope and feeling like you are on a team with your clinician to achieve the goals that you have. And that's really um, what we are looking for when it comes to the rehab process. And this is what we really um, try to do as much as we can in Movement Upgraded. It's just coaching. Um, and that is something I never knew when I was going through PT school. So it's pretty cool that we get to do this. I think it's amazing. I love being able to work closely with people to achieve these things. Um, and it's far more rewarding than I ever thought, um, that it would be. And I think it's really cool to see how the rehab process works that way. Instead of just thinking you're coming in and, and the clinician's fixing you, it's not that way. It's, it's more complex than that. So, um, it's pretty cool. And I love all the people that I've gotten to work with so far that have really taught me things because I learn from the people that I work with just as much probably as if not more as they learn from me, which is probably half makes up for like half of the stuff that I share in this podcast, to be honest. So you can thank all of my patients, former patients and clients for that. Um, but without further ado, that's everything I wanted to cover in this podcast. If you loved it, let me know, share with somebody who might benefit from learning these things and understanding the rehab process. This might be great for somebody about to start a rehab process or considering it, um, or somebody who's gone through physical therapy and they think that they did physical therapy and they, it didn't work rather than understanding that physical therapy is not uh, one way of doing things and one person doesn't represent the entire profession. It is multiple different ways of approaching things and maybe they can listen to this podcast and see that their prior uh, experience wasn't quite exactly the same thing as this. So there are a lot of approaches and we can always seek out more providers and different approaches. Um, if you haven't already make sure you subscribe to the podcast and get that notification when these come out on Fridays and also if you have not review if you have reviewed uh the podcast thank you so much if you have not go review please just just real quick set uh set a couple of seconds um aside to review I would appreciate it so much it's the best way you can support all this free content um and with that I will chat with you in the next podcast <laughs>